Well, Dennis, uh, on the 122 of 2000, you and I were at the uh, Fathers of Skin Diving get together. And uh, it was given by uh, Robin Credin. Credin? Yes, uh huh. And uh, the guy that uh, kind of got me into it was uh, Mark uh, uh, Marvelli. And uh, it was one hell of a good event because uh, we got to see people, uh, you and I being fathers of skin diving, starting way back in the 40s and 50s, uh, uh, were well represented by other people who we've known for 40 and 50 years. What do you think about that? Well, well, Dell, I don't go back quite that far, the 40s, uh, but I go back to the 50s, and uh, my uh, fame and fortune and skin diving and the competition and stuff really uh, hit an all-time high actually in the uh, 60s when I was in the uh, Hawaiian Islands, and I was quite well known there. They had my picture in uh, all the... Uh, shops over there in the uh, Hawaiian Islands that sold fishing gear and diving gear and uh, I had uh, of course along with that I had uh, uh, a couple of shows and let's go fishing and then I did my uh, well-known uh, uh, video of the uh, uh, seven uh, eight part series on uh, diving f uh, safety that I did for uh, public broadcasting so I became well known in the Hawaiian Islands uh, you, however, oh, you're internationally known, Del. Uh, let's hear a little bit about some of your exploits. Well, I, I came uh, I came to California, and uh, I, 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 when I got out of the service in 1946, I went into uh, commercial abalone diving with the old hard hat and uh, the big weight belt and the heavy boots and et cetera. And uh, we were doing it off of uh, Catalina and uh, off of uh, Palos Verdes. And we, we actually developed uh, getting rid of the, uh, the hard hat by using a, a Jack Brown outfit, which was just a full face mask with no big hard hat. And uh, it was uh, Jack Brown who invented it, and uh, he set the uh, diving record at, in the 40s at that time at 600 feet. So we started using that outfit, and uh, we were doing very well as far as commercial abalones went, but we were, I was only uh, 20 years old, so I had my girlfriend up in Oregon, and so we kind of got away from commercial diving, and I went up to Oregon to go to work, back to work, actually. You mentioned uh, Jack Brown. Uh, he's the guy that designed the uh, triangular mask for surface supplied air that I used when I went uh, through uh, Navy diving school when I was in the Marines. So that name brings back and rings a bell uh, for, for me. What, what, uh, what year did you go in the Marine Corps? Can't... I went in the Marine Corps in 19, uh, April 1945. And how long did you serve? Uh, 20 years. 20 years? Mm -hmm. A lot of it was in Hawaii, huh? Yeah, 20, well, Actually, I spent my last tour in the Marines over there, and uh, then after the tour was up, I spent another four years to complete my 20 and retired over there. Hmm. That was with your wife, Janice? Yeah, and, and the kids. And the kids. How many kids did you have at the time? At that time, I had three. Three kids. Well, actually, the third one didn't come along until actually after I retired from the Marine Corps. <laughs> Maybe you should have stayed in, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah. I uh, the Jack Brown outfit, uh, like you say, uh, uh, we uh, we dove with that, and uh, then kind of hung it up in uh, in '46 and went to uh, to Oregon, where I went back to work as a logger, which I had done at the age of 13 to 14 to 15. Uh, actually, uh, in the uh, when I was uh, 15, I started training to uh, go in the Marine Corps, and that was back in 1942. And I trained uh, real hard. I did 200 push-ups a night, plus doing all this labor 
in sawmills. So I was very strong. So I went in the Marine Corps, and uh, when I got in the Marine Corps, I was the strongest guy there. Nobody could beat me in any physical uh, contest. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we ran the obstacle course here in San Diego, uh, it was about a mile long. I came in first, and uh, all the DIs accused me of cutting the course and cheating. And I said, no, I didn't cheat. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. You, nobody could make that time. So I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. When everybody gets through, I'll run it again. And I ran it again, and I beat my time. So that I was very strong. And so uh, that was, went overseas for a couple of years in the South Pacific, and uh, was in uh, several battles, Saipan, Tinian, Floating Reserve for Okinawa and uh, Iwo Jima. And when I was, just before I was nine, before I, when I was 19, the war, war, the war was over. In August of uh, 45, they dropped the atomic bomb there, and uh, that was it. So I was, I turned 20 when I went to the occupation in Nagasaki, Japan, and then they shipped me home. And, and I went back into uh, logging again, of course, and then I uh, had a logging accident and, and lost my leg. Spent a year in the hospital. So I got married to my nurse, Betty Jo, in, uh, in 1948. And then uh, I think I actually came to uh, California in 49, prior to her coming down here to make some money to buy a house and et cetera. In 1950, we all moved. And I, then I started the uh, skin diving in, in 1950, late 1950, 51. Uh, just diving for abalone. That's all we would do. We'd go out and dive for abalone because uh, it was uh, good food. And then we started getting lobster, and uh, then we formed a uh, skin diving club called the Kingfishers. And everybody said, "Well, let's try spear fishing." I said, "Okay." So we we heard of pole spears, so we all made pole spears about ten feet long and put rubbers on the back of them and cocked them up good and we started getting fish and and then uh, <clears throat> a while later I bought an arbalete and uh, started fishing with the arbalete and the first fish, the first shot with the arbalete I got a big calico bass. First time I ever shot a spear gun. And so I went on from there, uh, our club in, uh, in 51, 52, we kept you know, trying to spear fish, and so then the, in '52 we started having competi interclub competitions to see who uh, who was going to represent our team in the '53 uh, underwater spear fishing contests. <coughs> so we uh, we started having competitions, and uh, for some reason I I used to get a half to three quarters of the amount of fish of the, all of my fellow club members. So in uh, one time we were sitting around the table, there was about, oh, I guess about 12 of us, and uh, after several months of winning all the time, one of the divers suggested that they, uh, that they give me a handicap. <laughs> so I started laughing, and I laughed until the tears rolled out of my, down my cheeks, and uh, and when I got through laughing, and nobody really understood why I was laughing. So that was my first club, the Kingfishers. What was your first club, Dennis? Well, <clears throat> my first club uh, was the Oceanside Green Dolphins, which uh, myself and a fellow by the name of Bud Dalton, who's now deceased, and uh, a few others that uh, names escape me right now. But uh, we formed that club in uh, 19... Uh, 60, no, 50. Yeah, because I was in Hawaii in 60. It was 1956. And we started out skin diving, okay? Because there weren't any, uh, we all wanted to scuba dive, but we didn't have any source of air in uh, where we lived in the North County area of San Diego. And we had uh, a lot of minor little meets uh, with other clubs and we won most of those and uh, our free diving depth was probably limited to around 35 to uh, uh, 45 feet mostly and we used to use uh, work the inside edge of the kelp beds 
where actually most of the fish actually hung out and still do right to this day because I was out there this last week. So uh, the, uh, uh, that didn't go anywhere. We had a competition with you guys at uh, Catalina. Uh, I can't remember the exact date. I think it was in uh, 58. Does that ring a bell? No. Yeah, it was, a, it was a Catalina with, uh, and you and the uh, mer Merman, uh, Jappy, and uh, and Frank Hops, yourself, and Tommy, ter ter Terry Lenz. It was either 57 or 59. Yeah, okay, one of those Probably two years. 57. Yeah, and Bobby Weaver was, was with the Neptunes, and mm -hmm. so we competed against you guys, uh, and of course, uh, we didn't even get a sniff. <laughs> but anyway, we had a lot of fun doing it, and I filmed that. And uh, I got a record of it right today, the, uh, the rewarding of the trophies and all that. And I even brought my camera out in that little boat we had to roll around out there. I remember the boat uh, was the uh, island lady that the Yeager brothers, uh, a big car dealership in Los Angeles, furnished the, uh, uh, the competitors to go out to uh, Catalina. And we stayed in the St. Catharines Hotel that's no longer there. It burned down. And the ship was too big to tie up at the pier. But anyway, it took us out to the dive site, and it broke down. And uh, we all assembled in this little cove, and I got some good movies of you standing there, and we were all talking about uh, the boat breaking down. And, of course, uh, all the guys in uh, the Oceanside Green Dolphin team were young Marines. <laughs> so I said, hey, guys. I said, what the hell? I said, let's roll back. <laughs> so we got in a little boat that had about four inches of freeboard, and we started rowing. We didn't know how far it was to, to the, uh, you know, the capital there, yes. Avalon. I mean, Jesus, I mean, it seemed like we rowed for about two and a half hours. We had to row down to the second point. <clears throat> but anyway, we got there way before the uh, boat came in. And, of course, we got there, and we got all the good food. Oh, God. <laughs> all the stuff you got was what, the, what we left the, over. All the good chow, huh? Well, you know, I, I, I remember that meat. Uh, being down there stuck and one thing I remember about that meet was that uh, I was diving uh, off a point there and I was about oh maybe 50 60 70 feet something like that to the and you'd fall off the cliff and down there at the bottom were all the fish at about 65 70 feet and this one uh, I was diving up and down I kept I'd make a dive I'd come up and I'd see this diver sitting there on his float watching me then I'd make another dive and come up and he'd still be watching me Finally, I went over, and I grabbed this float, and I shoved water right in his face twice. Boom, boom. I said, what the hell are you doing? I said, your teammates are out busting their butt trying to win this competition. You're sitting there watching me. Get off that float so, and, and follow me. I'll show you where the fish are. So I got, he got off the float and followed me. And uh, I made a dive, went down. You know how blue it gets way down deep. And uh, I, I didn't pay attention to what happened to him. I figured he was behind me. So I got down there and I speared about maybe a six pound sheephead and, and came up. And uh, and when I came up, all, he was on his float and all I could see was his fins kicking hard, getting away. And I, I didn't even know who he was. And and one one time, a, year, a couple of years later, I was up at the San Cal, San Cal Council up there in Central California. And this guy come up to me and he says, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, no. He says, well, I'm the guy that just splashed water in his face and gave hell to. And he says, you know, I followed you down. And when I got to 50, it was okay. When I got to 60, I was, I was pressing it. But when you went on down beyond that, he says, I left. <laughs> so that, I met this guy a couple of years later. So that was one of my experiences at that meet. But I don't know what year it was. Yeah, time... <clears throat> Time compresses for me. It's hard for me to distinguish from one era to the next mm -hmm. because, uh, well, you know, when you get in your 70s, uh, like we are. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm 75. We get a little absent-minded. Uh, and I'm 72. You know, but remember, I would have been sick. Uh, if I wasn't sick one year, I would have been 73. <laughs> you know? yeah. And then my father was so damn bashful. If it hadn't been for that, I'd been the same age as you. I've been <laughs> 75, you know. <laughs> well, anyway. You know, it's funny, I'll, I collected a few trophies there, and one time, I don't know what meet it was, but uh, our council decided to uh, award uh, big fish trophies. 
and they were going to give first, second, and third largest fish. So, <laughs> so the next meet that we had, uh, I got first, second, and third largest fish. I took all three trophies. And so the next meeting that we had in, this, in our council, they, they said, no, only one, one trophy per diver. <laughs> and so I did several things like that. Like uh, we had this one meet where everybody was lined up with their, with their little four-foot surf mass and their inner tubes, and they took off to the diving area. And I, I, I came down with a paddleboard. I took my paddleboard, I hopped down, put on it, and, and those guys were kicking toward, it was Point Furman, they were taking, kicking toward the point, and I started paddling toward the point. I passed them all. I was there about 10 minutes ahead of everybody else, and I could fish longer. I could, uh, I just, I could fish longer, and uh, when coming in, I could wait and fish longer and then come in faster. And the, the next council meeting, they had the band paddle boards. So they were off. I was always trying to get ahead of them. What you guys use? We use the uh, air mattress uh, and the uh, also the uh, the tubes with the uh, baskets uh, underneath the uh, gunny mm -hmm. sacks. We use those mostly for a local contest where uh, maybe the contest would be for gathering abalone. We had those kind of contests mm -hmm. too, and uh, uh, but uh, a lot of times we go out there with just a stringer and, and nothing mm -hmm. except the stringer in our belt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, you know, the guy that really uh, uh, helped me a lot was Charlie Sturgill. When I uh, went into my first competition, uh, uh, I think it was 53, that uh, he would, I said, you know, I asked everybody, who's the guy I have to beat? And they all pointed at Charlie. And uh, Charlie, you know, he stood, he had those little bitty fins about that long, uh, the little void fins, I guess, the, the ones that uh, Owen Churchill invented. And all he just had a mask and no snorkel, and uh, no suit. He didn't know what a wetsuit or a dry suit was for. And uh, so we'd enter the competitions. We entered this one competition and the first elimination meet. And uh, I came. I fi I fished for three and a half hours, and I came in and and uh, Ralph Davis called me up to the mic and he says, "Hey Dell, how'd you do?" He says, "I didn't get a fish. Nothing. Zero." And I said, nobody else is going to get any either. So about five minutes before the time was up, here comes Charlie in with about 50 pounds of fish. And I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it because I had spent three and a half hours out there trying to trying to fish and, I, and, and nothing. And so I, I really became dedicated at that point. I said, well, this is never going to happen again. And uh, in 1954, I went back to the same meet, first of eliminations, and uh, the top team got like uh, 47 pounds, and I got 45 pounds by myself. And that was one of the difficulties with our meets. Uh, like my teammates, they got about a half a pound of fish apiece, you know. So you, uh, our difficult, my di my personal difficulty was that uh, I couldn't find di divers that were equal to my ability, so that we could go on. I mean. It, even uh, if, if you were the top diver, you if if you didn't get enough fish, you were eliminated. You may win the top individual award, but you didn't you didn't progress. So I was uh, one of the guys that was called the club jumper. I went from the Long Beach Douglas Douglas Tritons to the Mirror Men to several other clubs until I found some guys that were um, of equal ability, so that you could go somewhere. And they and they were who? Well, and the Long Beach Douglas Tritons was, uh, I dove with Howard Patton, one of the top divers. He won the Inter-America Championship. Uh, he was uh, really, really a top diver. And then the, the club that I finally won with that uh, had two divers of, of uh, good ability was uh, Dick Jaffe and Frank Hops with the Muir, Muir Men. I dove with them for a couple of years. But uh, if you didn't have divers of your of equal ability, I mean, you didn't go anywhere. I mean, individually, until we started selecting divers on an individual basis to go to the world championships, and we didn't start. So I was selected to go to the, I think it was 56 and 57 to uh, the world championships, but uh, we didn't have any money, so we the boats were empty. They had them over there for us, but they were empty. The first time we ever got any money was in 1958, where we went to the uh, uh, 
no, it was 59. 58, we were selected, but we couldn't go. No money. 59, we went to Malta, and that's where Terry Lentz, uh, who's one of my, one of, real, one of my good pals, we all do we doped together for lobster, we doped together for, we surfed together for years. We'd go out to dive for lobster, and there'd be, with our surf mats, and there'd be no, be so bad you couldn't see, so we'd surf all night till two or three in the morning <laughs> with our surf mats. But Terry Lentz in 1959 won the uh, world championship and well deserved. He was 22 years old and uh, he did one heck of a job. Uh, I remember <clears throat> in Hawaii diving with Terry quite a few times uh, over in the Kona coast. I'd go over and visit with him and we'd go diving and uh, I was really amazed at his ability. I've seen, I've seen personally seen him skin dive to a depth of 130 feet. Of course, I was watching from about 40 feet. <laughs> <laughs> but I seen him to down here. I kind of knew how deep the bottom was. The sand was at at, at uh, 130, and he would get to the bottom and he would just lay there. He's a couple times I thought he was dead, you know. And then a fish would come swimming by, and he would just reach out and nail him, and then head right for the surface. Mm. And he'd do it repeatedly over and over again. I was amazed that anybody could dive that deep. Yes, Terry, Terry mm. was a, a very good diver, a well-trained diver. As a matter of fact, he was one of the first ones that, that one of the first divers that I saw had a, a regiment of training to, for diving, just specifically for diving. And uh, he kind of got me into it, uh, pushing weights a certain way, and uh, and doing a lot of push-ups and sit-ups, and, and uh, really training for the sport. I mean, like today, uh, I heck, I have a heck of a time fishing 60 feet, and when I get to that 100 push-up, oof, it's really tough. How about your training there, Dennis? Well, I don't train like that anymore. Uh, I, I swim a mile every day, freestyle, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, in the morning, I get up at uh, 5 o'clock. Sometimes I sleep into 5.30, you know? And I'll run around the park twice, which is up some hills, some pretty steep hills, and, of course, back down the hill. That's the part I like best. Mm -hmm. But after running around the park twice, that's, that's another mile, and I do it again in the evening. So uh, I just do that all year long. Uh, seven days a week, and then I dive, but I, I don't skin dive, I just scuba dive now. And mm -hmm. I don't even uh, bring my spear gun down anymore. I, uh, I, I just take an underwater uh, video camera down and see what I can pick up. Mm -hmm. I'm like you, I, I don't take my, uh, I still got my competition guns, the ones I've used for years and years, but I don't take them in the water because I, well, if I get in the water with a spear gun, I start competing. And so I just don't take them in. I, I, I go, I'm diving, uh, I go down and dive for lobster. I, uh, I'm going to Mexico for a month pretty soon, and I'm going to dive for uh, clams and various things like that, bottom things. But I'm not going to take my spear gun. Yeah, the uh, camera for me, uh, every time I bring it down, I don't get footage. Uh, along the coast here, maybe... Uh, w one or two minutes out of every ten times I bring it down. If I go to the offshore islands like uh, uh, San Clemente, Catalina, Santa Barbara, Santa Rosa, or any of those offshore islands, mm -hmm. uh, I can get quite a bit of footage all one time, and uh, in, and then I usually assemble that into a, some kind of a little movie. And uh, I've assembled several of these movies. And uh, what I do now is uh, after I get a good storyline going, I'll uh, put, you know, put them all together and. Uh, in a storyline and uh, combine the underwater shots and topside shots that may have been shot a whole year before or something, you know. But anyway, I get uh, a story going with continuity and I entered these different contests. And I won quite a few. I uh, won an international award uh, just uh, 1965, I mean, 65, I think, and way back then. In 95, uh, Vancouver, uh, an international contest, uh, Interspace or Ocean. And I got uh, a top ten there, and uh, just this uh, last year I got uh, uh, top ten for uh, hungry divers. Uh, some of my buddies going down there, and they get the uh, abalone. And 
um, as you were down Abilene, uh, rock scallops, take them apart, start eating them underwater. <laughs> so that's why we call it hungry divers. <laughs> but it's kind of corny, but it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun. And uh, actually now I, I dive for fun. I dive as much as I can. Uh, actually, I dive quite a bit now. Well, as a, uh, you and I, as old fathers of skin diving, what, do you, what, what kind of business are you in now? Well, now, uh, believe it or not, I went into the uh, video business. And uh, that came about, it was kind of a long story, make it long story real short. Uh, when I was in Hawaii, I had a dive school. And when I had this dive school, I developed my own audio-visual teaching system. And this uh, it was developed in 1964, I got the date finally right. And uh, a guy from uh, public broadcasting uh, that just started there in Hawaiian Islands went through one of my scuba courses at the YMCA. He said, hey, that, those are fantastic training aids. Would you do a, uh, uh, you know, a story for uh, public broadcasting? So, so that wound up to be an eight-week series. And, of course, I didn't, know anything about, yeah, I didn't know anything about TV now. I sh uh, shot all the underwater stuff with underwater film cameras that I made. And uh, they were made out of molded fiberglass. Incidentally, uh, Al, Al Giddings came by my house one day, and he saw the saw the motor fiberglass uh, uh, housing, and he wanted me to get out of the Marine Corps. <laughs> and started making cameras for him. I said, oh, I, said, I got a contract. I said, I can't break it. But anyway, uh, what happened is uh, they, they looped that. They, they run it for two years. They looped it. In other words, no more finish mm -hmm. it, and they run it again. Prime time. I got to be pretty well known, uh, but I, I knew nothing uh, really about television whatsoever. And then uh, when I came back to the mainland, I retired from the uh, scuba school business in Hawaii. The Marines uh, latched onto me at uh, Camp Pell and wanted me to start a scuba school for them, which I run for eight years. And uh, uh, after I finished with that, I went to Social Security because I figured, geez, I'm getting kind of old to teach these young Marines how to go through the surf. <laughs> I was got to always do the demonstrating because I figured if I got wiped out, they'd get wiped out for sure. But anyway, what happens is I go to Hawaii with my wife, uh, look up uh, an old friend of mine who passed away the day before I got there, asked his wife uh, when I could come over and see her. She said, well, she'd come over a couple of days, all the people crying and everything would be gone. She, and so I went over and seen her about, you know, about a week later. She tell me that uh, she's gonna, his son was going to come from Japan and bury his uh, ashes out there in the reef. And what happened is that uh, I says, no, I says, Mary, this can't be. I says, uh, Roy wouldn't like that. I says, let me take his ashes and I'll, and I'll put them out, dump them off the side of the boat into the ocean right over the OK Corral, which is way out where the, arc, where the continental shelf drops off into the deep water, you know. I mean, really deep water. So I went out there and I make the long story short, I nailed a 105-pound uh, uh, Jack Gravel in about 150 feet of water with tanks on, of course, underneath the ledge. And uh, coming up, the top of the ledge was 85 feet. <clears throat> Roy's ashes were about 15 feet below the top of that ledge and went back through his uh, ashes with that, uh, with that big fish. And it almost killed me because he had me underneath the ledge for a while. And my wife got really upset. She said, why don't you start making movies like you used to do back in the old days? Were you doing it just for fun with your own homemade cameras? I said, well, I, says, I don't have any of that stuff. She said, well, she said, I'll buy a video camera. So she bought me a video camera that didn't work very well. I, I got it back, took it back to where I got it, traded it in for a next higher model, which was a Hi8 camera. And then you've been in my, my lab here. <laughs> and you see what those, all the stuff I got now. And so... Uh, uh, I, I felt kind of guilty because I was spending her inheritance money uh, <laughs> uh, on all this video equipment. So I said, well, I said, I'll make a business out of it. So I started doing wedding videos and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, she wouldn't get so upset every time I want a new piece of equipment. And uh, so that's, uh, that's what, I'm, what I'm doing now is a part-time uh, enhancement to my uh, uh, retirement from the uh, Marine uh, pension and uh, Social Security. And uh, it's been a lot of fun and uh, a lot of adventure. And uh, we're having an adventure right now doing this, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, we sure are, Dennis. Well, that's that's amazing that uh, you're in that business doing weddings and uh, 
videos of any kind. Yeah, any kind. Uh, uh, just call me up and, and you'll, you'll do it. Right. Well, I, uh, you know, it, it, it was funny that uh, at the uh, Fathers of Skin Diving get-together the other night, uh, I got to see guys like Art Pinder, uh, Paul Damon, uh, guys that I haven't seen in, in 40 years. It was a really a, a thrill to me because uh, I dove with these guys and uh, 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 Jay Rife was there and, and, and against Jay Rife one time that's the best dive I've ever made in my life. The best one. And, and you, you saw Jay and Rife discuss it and, and why. But it was really uh, great to see all those old guys and, and uh, getting together like that and ha having it available, the space available to do it, I really appreciate that uh, that they did put it together for us. Well, I, I would like to take this opportunity to really thank Robin for, uh, for his all-out effort he put into this, because if it worked for him, uh, this would never have happened. And I think for a uh, matter of just our appreciation, we ought to send him a copy of this. I think we should too, because Robin and, and also Mark. Oh yeah, Mark. Yeah. Mark is the guy that uh, really contacted me and uh, steered me in the right direction. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been there if Mark hadn't have called me. And uh, what triggered uh, me going, I usually don't go to these type of things. Uh, he said that Art Pinder was going to be there and Terry Lentz and uh, Paul Damon. And I said, hey, you get, I'm coming <laughs> because I haven't seen these guys in so long. And I, I too, want to thank Robin and uh, and Mark for all their efforts. I really appreciate it. But, uh, That's it. but there's one thing I, uh, one last thing I want to tell these guys. All these divers I competed against all my life. I wonder if they realized that they were diving against a diver who had one foot in the grave. <laughs> Was the other one on the banana peel? The other one on the banana peeling. <laughs> God, we're corny. <laughs> we? I didn't work corny, are we? <laughs> but that works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks, Robin. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Robin. Yeah.